let's get started. few quick announcements. First of all, the videos online, uh, we're having a couple problems last week or so, but they should be all up now. Um, I guess the, the two on, the, the ones on PowerFlow and then Power Electronics should be up, they look fine. The one from last time actually, the, I must have hit the camera or something and it got kind of pointed up, so you can't really see my writing on the board. And I think I had turned that light on over there, so the slides are kind of washed out too, though you can follow along with the actual PDF of course. Um, but it might be kind of hard to read, especially because it's off screen, some of what I'm writing. So sorry about that. I guess it's one of the joys of, of, of me doing this instead of paying a lot of money to have a professional do it. But um, hopefully, you know, it's the cost benefit trade off there is, is, is the right choice. Um, I have the homework too. So I'll finish a few minutes early and talk about the homework. It was all, overall very good, but there were a few uh, common bugs this time that I wanted to, to, to address on the homework. And so I'll finish maybe 10 minutes or so early and we, and we can do that. And um, Office hours are next next Monday, and since the homework is due on Thursday, I'll have more office hours next Wednesday as well, and I'll announce that on Monday. Um, okay, were there any questions from last time? We st we started covering sort of a basic introduction of a lot of points like dynamical systems and controls optimization. These two topics we're going to cover a lot more in the in the upcoming lectures. In particular, we're going to talk today a lot more about dynamical systems. Uh, and then later on we'll talk about uh, optimal control and controls optimization. And so both of these two topics will be dealt with in a lot more detail here in different settings where you have things like uncertainty in the dynamics or you have more complex dynamics. Um, but, but really this is sort of the basis of a lot of the control we're going to do here is thinking about dynamical systems, what that means to have a state that evolves over time, and then how do you optimize some objective under that constraint. That's kind of the core of the control that we're going to do here. So I'm going to start today with giving two examples of simple control tasks. And, and, and these are simple tasks in some sense. The systems are very small. They're both, in both cases one state. So there isn't a lot of, of state here and there's one control each. So you don't have a lot of um, things to do or things to control. But even here what we'll see is that the, the treating controls optimization especially if you have a notion of you know, what's going to happen in the future and things like that, if you have predictions about the future, this can already induce some very complex, or not really necessarily complex, but very complex seeming behaviors that, that look very intelligent. And so even with a very simple set of control laws, we can actually, and, and sort of control frameworks, we can get very sort of very exotic in some sense kind of control for different domains. And, and, and you'll see that today. So the first example we're going to talk about is building heating. As I said before, the basic pro uh, problem here is very simple. It's, it's the task is we want to control the temperature in a, in a room in a building. Just think about one room in a building, for example. And we want to do it in a way that maintains some notion of comfort when the room is occupied and saves energy uh, subject to the constraint that we have to maintain comfort. Right? And the way we define comfort here, and a lot of times this could be defined either as a cost or as a constraint. So sometimes they'll define comfort as a cost. You say, you know, the squared error between the desired temperature and the actual temperature, that would be a reasonable cost. But you might also want to just add those um, requirements on comfort as actual constraints to optimization. Remember, we're allowed to put constraints on the states and on the controls in our problem here. So here we're going to formulate in some sense the notion of comfort as constraints on the allowable temperature in the room. Okay, so this plot shows uh, 24 hours in a day, and then the red and green lines here show the range of temperature that we're allowed to have the room in. Okay, so up until about 9 a.m. or so, we're allowed to have it in a fairly big range. This corresponds to the room being, say, unoccupied during that time, right? The room is unoccupied then, so we don't really care. I mean, we don't want it to get too cold, uh, but, you know, it, it within a reasonable range, we're, we're okay. This is, by the way, sort of a heating day, right? Because the temperature is actually lower than the temperature we want, so we have to heat the room to maintain temperature there. But then, at, starting at 9 till about 12 or so, there's a, there's a period where we have sort of a very narrow gap in our allowable temperature. This corresponds to the room being occupied during that time. And so when the room's occupied, we want the temperature, I think, in this case, between 70 and, right? 70, 72 degrees. That's very high for, for heating, I guess. I'm, I'm being very wasteful here, maybe. Um, maybe it's like 68, I can't quite tell from that. From that. I, mean, I think maybe 69, 71. It, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, 
Then at about 12, there's another two hours where the room's unoccupied, so we can have temperature expand again. We have the, our allowable range expand again. Then the room becomes occupied again, then it becomes unoccupied. So a very simple sort of task. And we're going to make the other assumption that we kind of know this schedule ahead of time. So that's, that's actually a very big assumption here, because we might not always know when rooms are going to be occupied or unoccupied. But assuming for now that we do know it, um, and this would be the same case, for example, if there's just going to be, say, a fixed schedule for the building. If you assume, which a lot of buildings do, that you need to control temperature during these hours and during other hours, it doesn't have to be as, as fixed. So if we, if we assume all that, then, then um, we're, we're going to assume that we know this. And we're also going to assume that we know the out, how the outside temperature is going to evolve. Because outside temperature will affect, of course, how much heat we need to, to pump into our room. So if we assume both those things, and the outside temperature, maybe we don't have quite as good predictions, but we can still get pretty good predictions of how it's going to evolve. Say at the beginning of the day, we, you know, the forecast for that day is pretty good. So we'll assume all that's known. And the question is, how should we control heating to optimize some objective? Now, of course, I haven't said what that objective is yet. And the objective in this case is going to be minimizing, oops, actually, let me show this slide first. It's going to be minimizing the cost of electricity. So we're going to assume a very simple model for the price of electricity. We're going to assume that in what I'll call off-peak hours, which is bet uh, before 7 a.m. and after, that's about 6 p.m. Uh, no, sorry, that's more like 7 p.m. Uh, at night. That the cost of, of uh, energy is fairly low, and during the middle of the day, it's a lot higher. I think in practice, that actually would be a little bit further out that you would, you would have a higher cost of energy, but it doesn't really make a, a big difference here. So this is a very simple model, and, and it's not the most realistic, but actually a lot of time of use pricing for electricity does actually follow this form. This is different from the actual cost of electricity that, say, you compute at, using those optimal power flow things we talked about last time on the power market. That gives you a price of electricity that varies uh, a lot with time and sort of very uncertain in a lot of ways. Um, but what utilities will do is they, when, when they actually offer a price to a consumer, they won't offer the true market price to the consumer. What they'll instead do is offer just sort of blocks, tiered pricing in blocks, saying during this time electricity costs you this much, during this time it costs you this much. This, this is an example of a simple kind of tiered pricing scheme, a time of use pricing scheme. And the goal is, as I said, we want to maintain comfort in that room uh, with, with heating. I guess we're assuming that we're using electrical heating here, which is not the best example, but we're going to just assume that we're doing that. Uh, we're going to assume, and so we want to maintain the temperature within that band, subject to minimizing the total cost of electricity we purchase. Okay, that's our goal. Um, and what we need to do that to, to sort of to know what, what, how to do this is we need to know, first of all, how will the heating, how will the state of the room, the temperature of the room, evolve according to the actions we take, which in this case is turning on or off a heater. How will that, how will that evolve? Um, and then what's the cost? And the cost is I'm showing you here. So remember, the, the sort of control paradigm we had before was we needed to know a few things. We first we needed to find the state, state at time t. We need to define the control at time, that, what, what the control is and what that means. We need to find the dynamics which tell us how the state evolves. So x t plus 1 equals f x t u t. We need to find what this dynamics is. And then we need to find a cost function, cost of x t and u t. Okay? So this slide, I guess, gives the cost, gives that last one. The cost only depends on um, the u, which is essentially going to be how much electricity we use here, given the heater being on or off. Um, and then the, the, uh, I'm going to define next these other, these other three elements. So how does heating in a building work? It's, to a first approximation, very simple. Um, there, if you look up heat transfer online, you'll find crazy math because that's talking about you know, the partial differential equations actually solving sort of, the, you know, um, sort of the continuous time flow of heat through materials. Stuff like that. We're not going to worry, worry about any of that here. We're going to have one variable. Uh, which is this uppercase T. And to a first approximation, heat transfer can be approximated as a, as a linear system. And what this means is that um, the derivative, time derivative of temperature equals some function of the current temperature times the external temperature, um, where everything else but T and T external are constants here. So um, U, for example, is the conductivity of the material. A is the area that the, that the heat's conducting through. Uh, v is the volume of the room. 
Uh, Cp, I believe, is the, the specific heat constant, it's the constant, and I think rho is the density. Uh, don't worry about what any of those things are. It's just, this is just the first law of thermodynamics, essentially, for, for approximating sort of a point of, of heat transfer. So we're going to approximate the whole room having, having one temperature. We're not going to be worrying about like, the, the flow of heat through the room or anything like that. Um, now, this is a differential equation. This is a continuous time version of this, right? But to actually go to a, to a discrete time one, and to simplify it a lot, we can actually sort of wrap up all those constants and the thing like the and, and the things like, like the time step we're talking about. We can bundle that all up together into a very simple set of systems here. So we're going to say that the uh, state is going to be one dimensional. So xt is going to be one dimensional here, and it's just going to be the temperature in the room. Ut is also going to be one dimensional, and it's going to be the, the heater being on, but really I'll call it like the injected heat. Is that what I'm calling it there? Yeah, injected energy. So that will, that will add to this thing. Essentially, if you, if you add more energy, that would just add an extra term here, because these are units of energy, um, or rather change in energy. So, so if, you, if you add a little bit, add a little bit more energy to have some constant. Um, and the dynamics now, if we take those dynamics there, the sort of the, the differential equation, the first order kind of physics of the system, then um, we can define the dynamics in a very simple way. What we, what we define them as is xt plus 1. Well, let me measure at this again. So we have some system like this where we have x dot, right? Because the, the, this term here is the derivative of temperature uh, equals some constant times the current temperature, which is just x, minus uh, the external temperature, T external. And then it's also actually plus some other constant times u. Um, it actually isn't quite, this would have the injected power and injected energy here, but don't, don't worry too much about that. Um, in our case, it'll actually be energy because we're going to look at, this, at the, the uh, discrete time case. So this is sort of our, our equation here where we have some constants. And, the, and these constants, k and, and u, just come about due to the sort of the, the physical properties of the room. And we can just compute these, or we could actually estimate them from data too, right? We could look at turning up the heat on and off, figure out how the, how the outside temperature affects the temperature in the room, and then figure out how the heater affects the temperature in the room, and to estimate those constants, right? This would be the... Um, this would be the sort of the, the continuous time version of this. And as we talked about before, the way we convert that to a discrete time system is just by Euler integration. And I'm actually going to also <laughs> just wrap up. So it would be delta t, essentially it's xt plus delta t times x dot. right? But I'm actually going to go be even a little simpler than that. I'm going to wrap up everything in terms of including the delta t into those constants. So I'll call these like k tilde and b tilde, just so there's no confusion there. Um, and I'm going to write this like this. It's going to be x uh, k plus x t minus t external at time t plus b of u t. So that's where these are just some constants, and what they actually are is sort of unimportant for our purposes here. Uh, their, their relative magnitude does, of course, matter because you know if this is really big, then Theoretically, at least, you could you know, change the temperature in the room really, really quickly, for example. And I want, you know, as long as they're reasonable, as long as they're based on physical properties, then this is a reasonable description of the dynamical system of how heating works in a room. Now, the important point here is this is a linear dynamical system, right? Or actually an affine dynamical system. Because what we said was that affine systems were something where we could write this as uh, AXT, or rather A, big AXT, plus B, UT, plus little AT, something like that, right? And this is the, exactly that property. So um, A here would be just 1 plus K. It's a number because A, because X is the one dimensional state. So an, uh, 1 by 1 matrix is just a scalar. So this is 1 plus K times XT plus B times UT plus this little AT here where AT is going to be um, negative KT external at time t. 
Okay, so this is a linear dynamical system. And, and that, that's, that's the sort of the big point of all this, is that this system can be described as a linear, really an affine system, but it's essentially the same thing. Where all these constants here are just from physical properties of the system, and we're going to assume that we can compute them, you know, again, by just doing the math out from first principles or by learning them somehow. Okay, so now I've defined, maybe I'll write this here. Uh, uh, one, pl oh, did I, did I, no, one, did I put my signs here? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, sorry, I, I, I swapped this order here. So it's actually one minus k, and this is plus, it's minus this, and plus that, right. Okay, so, so, so now we've defined, I'll erase this now, just to get out of the way, but I'll put it back up here. Uh, well, this is one minus k times xt plus b u t plus um, k t external at time t. Okay, so that's that's sort of, that's sort of dynamics there. And now our cost. So our cost now is this thing here, which essentially is something like um, our cost is you know uh, zero point oh eight uh, for t. And I'll just make t correspond to the actual hour of the day now. Um, you have to make sure that your other constants are correct given your delta t because we included delta t into these things, remember? So be careful about that, but that, that, that's sort of okay for now. Um, so it's gonna be like neg negative 0 0.8 if t is less than, what time is that, like seven? Or t is greater than, um, you know, like, 18 or something. That's pretty, that's actually a really early time for the peak to end. Not very realistic, but it's actually the other end that we get most of our savings here. Um, and then it'll be something like 0 0.22 otherwise. Okay, so, so um, this is actually, so actually this is, um, sorry, let me just be more specific than this. This equals, um, cost here equals ut times this, where we'll assume that ut is in units of kilowatt hours. So that's sort of the injected energy put into the room. Um, you know, I, I'm writing cost per kilowatt hour here. It doesn't really matter what the units of u are as long as you get the units of b to be correct here. So b has to scale between whatever you know, the, the amount of energy you use for your heater is versus how much that will actually heat the room. But those are just constants, constant conversion factors there. And then the cost does not just depend on the state here. We, we are wrapping the cost based on the state into those constraints rather than cost itself. Um, but it depends on the, the amount of energy we use. Okay, so does this, 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 make, this sort of formulation make sense to everyone here? We, we've defined everything we need to know for a control task. We've defined the cost. Um, I guess the cost really is something that should also include constraints. It's like it's infinite if this, if this, if the state is out of the, those bands there, but I, I won't write that. That's sort of also an important element though. So the cost will have that, and then what's going on here? Huh. So we defined all these elements, we define the, what the state is, what the control is, what the dynamics are, and what the cost is. And that's what you need for a control task. Um, and now, you just solve the optimization problem, really. Um, you just solve the optimization problem that says, we want to minimize the cost of energy subject to the dynamics constraint and the other constraints we have in the state. And in that case, this takes the following form. So here, C is going to be a vector, so, okay, so, so, so let me uh, sort of formalize what I'm doing now. I'm taking all this now and writing it as a single optimization problem, just in, in the form that we're used to. Um, these constraints and objectives are all linear here. So this will be a linear program that we are writing here that will, be the op the, that will find the optimal control for the system. And what the control problem says is minimize over X and U, remember our, our Convention here is that we 
minimize over x. So x is a variable of, this, of the system, even though it's really going to be determined by this constraint on the dynamics here. That's what we'll see in a second. So we're going to minimize over x and u. In this case, c transpose u. c here is a vector of the costs. So that is just a, a, a single vector of all the costs at, from time 1 to time, uh, I guess I'm just writing it to t, but that's, that's 24 time steps, I believe. I might have a finer scale than that. We'll see in a, we'll see in a second. Um, so, so the vector c is the vector of the cost of energy over all those times. So that's what we want to minimize. Subject to this first one is the dynamics of the system itself. So subject to the constraint that the state has to evolve according to these dynamics. And subject to the fact that the first state has to be equal to the first state we're actually in. So you know, we can't pick anything we want for our first state. We have to pick a state that we're actually started in. Um, whatever that is right now when we start our optimization problem. And then we have um, upper and lower bounds for what t is, sorry, for what x is in this case. It has to be within that range. And, this is, and, and, and so here t l and t u are vectors of all those um, bounds on temperature over the whole day. We also need to constrain the control itself. So the control itself has to be, I mean, typically we can't have our heater, you know, we don't have an infinitely powerful heater in the room. The heater will be somewhat constrained to output, you know, some amount. And, and we're going to like, just in this case, assume that the heater can go between zero and, and one kilowatt hour, essentially in terms of the heated injects per, per hour. So one, essentially a one kilowatt heater. Again, you can always rescale U, so you can always constrain U to be whatever, in whatever range you want as long as your costs and your dynamics, sort of the constants there, make sense for the range that U is in. And now we just solve it. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to set up the set of constraints. C, big C is, is a vector of all the constraints, so you know, the first state has to be equal to say 55 degrees is where we start. Um, and then we set up all the constraints, the first one being the dynamics have to be obeyed over the whole time. Um, then we have to be within the bounds on the temperature, and we have to be within the bounds in the control. Okay, and we solve this problem, just with, this is just a Yalmip formulation there, and what we get is this. So here's what's happening. Here is the, again, the, the lines we saw before are the same. So this blue line is the outside temperature, the green line is the, um, is the lower bound, red is the upper bound, so we want and then the, uh, the blue line now is the actual control temperature that we achieve using this, using this optimization problem. So that's the resulting x you get once you solve this. And here's what it does. So, and, and so this is a really simple problem in some sense, right? But it already does some pretty complex stuff. So what, what it does is it, the controller decides in some sense, I'll use the word like it's, like it's a rational thing, I guess. But the controller decides to start heating the room at like 4 in the morning. So, so at that point, it's really low, and then it starts hitting the room at like 4, and then stops at 7, lets it cool back down, and then right before the person arrives, it heats it back up to, to the desired temperature, keeps it there when they go, let it kind of trail off um, when they're not there, then heats it back up right before they come back, and then lets it go, go down. So that's sort of what happens to the state over this time period. This graph here shows the actual control that's being applied, this is um, the, the heater. We're, we're going to assume here that we can kind of set the heater to intermediate values, like it's you know, 0.1 or something like that. In practice, you would do this by you know, turning on and off quickly enough to sort of get a fractional-like value. Um, but we're going to assume that we have to have sort of continuous control over our heater. Um, this shows the values of the controller. So it's, you know, sometimes here it's maximum value, sometimes here it's minimum value uh, over time. So, yeah? So the bottom one, is that our... U? Yes, so the bottom one here, the blue line in the bottom shows the U. The uh, cyan line above shows the X. The resulting U and X that we get once we solve the optimization problem. So th those were not inputs, those were the output of the optimization problem. Uh, the other things are essentially the inputs. The other things encode these, these guys here. And so, does anyone, can, so, so why is it doing this, I guess is the question. Why does it sort of start off heating and let it drop down, then heat it back up. Is there any thoughts? Yeah. Because it's less expensive. Right. Before seven. Exactly. But how does it optimize and knows what time to begin? So we, we, we 
uh, R is something that we give it the cost here. So we give it the cost, and so it knows that at 7, electricity will go up, the price. It also knows the dynamics of the system. So it knows exactly what temperature it can get it to if it executes certain actions before 7 o'clock. So what's happening here is exactly what you say. So essentially, it is better to heat the room earlier rather than later. Right? Because it's a lot, in this whole time period here, it's much cheaper to heat the room. Then there's another little subtle thing. So, so the other question is, why does it wait until right before the person comes to heat it back up? Why doesn't it just do that you know, at any point? Why does it choose right then to do it? But, but why is it the minimum cost? It, it, yes, that's sort of a tautological, right? It definitely does the minimum cost. But it also keeps in mind the minimum set point of temperature that has to be maintained. So it does, right. But why does it choose here to do it? So, so why not raise temperature there and let it? I mean, that would take the same amount. You know, it, would, it would sort of, uh, why, why do you do it right at the end as opposed to a little bit before? Why does that matter? The, the price is the same electricity in this whole time period there. Yeah. Yes, that's that's yes. I think that's that, that that's the reason. And the other reason is um, the outside temperature is higher here than it is beforehand. So so you will always leak out the temperature, but you will actually leak it less if you wait till later because then the outsides is is, is a little warmer. Um, this is this is a, such a very minor point because you're always leaking stuff, right? So here, you know, you 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 would. For example, even when you're just maintaining temperature at the, at the lower bound, you have to use a little bit of heat, actually. You can't quite use, it, use none of it. But because your dissipation actually varies with the difference between your inside temperature and outside temperature, there's a small little effect there. So it actually will choose to wait to, to do anything before you, before you heat the room. Um, then you know, what it's doing is it just maintains temperature at this, at this point here. It just does whatever it needs to to maintain temperature there. Um, lets it drop while the room's unoccupied. So you know, in this period, give me a call. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> let me turn that off. Hasn't happened before. Um, during these periods, it actually turns off the thing entirely because there's, you know, it, it's within the temperature range. It doesn't need to turn it on at all. Um, at the, again, when it's sort of at the bound, it needs a little bit of, of heating, but not a lot, and then it lets it fall again. So this, this is a very sort of complex, I would say, policy in some sense. It would be very hard for me to write down a program initially that would do exactly this, right? Because a, a lot of times controllers for buildings are sort of just simple programs, right? Something like these are the times, if the temperature is below a certain amount this time, turn it on, otherwise turn it off. And, and that can work okay, but it's not solving a problem optimally. It's not really giving you the best solution you can. Um, and getting that best solution, actually, if you're just going to write the program manually to do it, that would be really hard, I think, to sort of write a program that would give you this sequence here without really knowing what's, you know, <laughs> just give you this based on the, the, the inputs. The, the only way I can see to get this solution here is actually going through that problem and solving that optimization problem. So that's the, the short of it is that we're getting very complex looking behavior here. And we're doing it even though um, it would be very hard to write out explicitly. And we're doing it just through this optimization formulation. Where we just input what we want to minimize, it takes care of everything else. Now one more example here is going to be um, an example of energy storage for wind. Okay, so this is, this is a different domain now. Now the question is, suppose we are a a battery operator, okay, um, and we want to make money off storing energy from, say, a wind farm. The uh, the best thing to do, in some sense, would be to sell energy when, well, when we you know can generate it from the wind, um, but also if. If we can store some amount of energy, we can generate, you know, the wind's always blowing. So it's always generating some amount of energy. That will, of course, depend on the actual wind itself. Um, very heavily it depends on the wind. Uh, so this first plot here shows the wind speed over time over for a day. Um, wind energy actually uh, increases up to a certain threshold, increases with the cube 
of the wind speed. So um, you know, a little bit more wind actually can mean a lot more power. So this is very variable like that. So this next plot here shows the power you get from the wind. And the next plot importantly shows the price of electricity. This is, this is, this is actually the sort of the, the true price of electricity at, you know, at the electrical market or whatever. So now we're talking about you know, if, if you are a, a, you're wanting to bid into the market, <coughs> being a wind farm or a battery operator, what, what, maybe we'll just assume that you have both of them. You have the wind farm and the battery. Um, what you would like to do is if, it is if you know the price of electricity is about to go up, You'd rather take your current wind, and rather than just selling it to the market right now, you'd rather store it and then wait till it gets expensive, um, before, and, then, and then you sell it to make a bigger profit. Now, of course, it's going to be a loss associated with the battery. Um, but if there's you know, not enough loss and the price is going to be higher enough, then this could still be a net win. Um, so, so again, the, the point being that if you don't have storage, you, don't need, you can't really do anything, right? All you can do is just sell whatever you make. But when you have storage, you can actually store energy when the price is low and then release it when the price is high. So again, this is going to be a dynamical system. And I'm actually going to model it as a really simple one with no loss in the batteries. This is sort of like the best you could possibly do, though it's easy to also include in losses in the battery. Um, so here, again, we have to do the exact same thing. We have to define, I shouldn't have erased those ones. We have to define our state, our control, our dynamics, and then our cost. Okay. And in this case, what our oops, I shouldn't have. Actually, that's probably fine. So, what our state is going to be in this case is going to be again a one-dimensional vector, and the only real state to the system. Actually, I'm going to guess what the state is. What should the state? Oh, I have it up there. Never mind. I was thinking I just had that up there. So this <laughs> it's easy to answer now. Um, the state of this in this case is going to be the only thing that really persists over time is the actual amount of energy we have stored in the battery. All right. So the, so the, the, the state is the total energy in the battery. The control is also going to be a vector in. in not like prime or anything. The control, which is also vector R1, um, is the amount of energy you put into the battery at time t. Right? So, so the control, the, the, the choice we have as, a per, as, as an operator, a wind farm operator with a battery attached to it, um, is do we sell the energy right now or do we actually store it for later? So the, the control is the total energy or the, the energy um, put into the battery. Um, and this can either be positive or negative. If we're taking energy out of the battery, it will be negative. If we're putting it into the, into the battery, it will be positive. There are also external variables. The big external variable that we worry about here is just the, the actual wind, the external wind. I mean, that's, that's a big factor, right? We don't have any control over that, though. That's just an external thing that changes with time. Um, and then the other, other external thing is going to be the cost, electricity at time t. For this problem, we're going to assume that we know these right now, but we're also going to make the very, very big assumption that we're going to know these, how these evolve in the future, too. Um, unlike for a heating, building heating where this might be reasonable, and you're, you're on a tiered pricing plan and you know the, say, the constraints of the building, this is probably not very reasonable here. Um, so I'm using it to illustrate a point. Uh, in practice, there would be a lot of uncertainty associated with the, how much energy you're going to produce over the next, say, 6 or 10 hours, and the cost of electricity over the next 6 or 10 hours. Now, you can still make predictions about those things and use predictions here in lieu of the true values, um, but that is sort of getting into a topic that we're going to discuss later. Uh, so here we're going to assume everything is known. So again, this is a pretty simple system. So, our, our, and actually, sorry, I didn't write it here. So the, 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 the dynamics of the system is just actually very simple. It's just the x t plus 1, so the total energy we have stored in the battery is going to be just the total energy the current time plus, wow, well, you know, the energy we store. So this is a pretty simple dynamical system here. Um, if you, you know, are adding energy, then you uh, have more energy the next day. And if you're subtracting it off, then you have less. Um, another very important point, though, is that there are limits to this. So very importantly, 
Um, this state here, there's also going to be constraint on the state here. And the state constraint says xt can never go below zero and never be above some Emax value where Emax is the capacity of the battery. Right? You can't, you can't sort of sell power more and more if you don't have it in the, you can't sell power if you don't have it in the battery. Uh, and the battery charge can never go negative. And the cost, I guess, would just be, I didn't define it formally here, but what, what, actually, does anyone know what the cost would be? So what's the cost of time t? Um, given xt is the charge of the battery, ut is the amount we put into or take it off, and et is the external. Uh, so it would be the cost of electricity, so it would be ct is the external variable times what? The energy generated minus the energy taken out. The energy, sorry, the energy what? The energy generated at time t. That so, is yep, ET. Minus the energy that is taken out of the battery. Right, exactly. Uh, well, minus the energy is, or is, so UT is, UT is positive when we're putting energy into the battery, and negative when we're taking it out of the battery. So is this a, so it's plus or minus, which one is it? Yeah, plus or minus. <laughs> so, so w w which one is it though? Is it plus or minus? Minus, because you're putting yeah, something into the right, it's minus. Because UT by definition, I mean, you can make it the other way around too, it would be fine, but UT by definition is positive when you're taking, putting energy into the battery we're defining it as. So that means you're, you're not giving that energy to the grid then. So you're not putting it into the grid, it means you're not getting paid for it. On the other hand, if this is negative, then this will increase the amount of energy you're putting into the grid, um, and so then you get paid more for it. Now we have everything that we have our, for our problem again. We have the dynamics, the, the state, the control, the dynamics, and the cost. And we just form an optimization problem that, that does this all. So again, we're going to optimize over x and u. These are, these are both these times sort of variables in rt, where t is the number of total states we have. Um, it's a little easier here because in this case they're just single states, so we can store sort of the states over the whole time as a, uh, as a big vector. If, if the states are actually themselves vectors, it gets a little trickier. You just have to store all the states as like a big matrix rather than a vector. So we'll get to that shortly, but for here, there can be all vectors. Um, subject to the dynamics, well, your energy in the battery is going to be equal to your energy plus the whatever you put in. Um, the very important constraint that the energy in the battery can never go negative or never go above Emax. We're also going to put a, a ramp constraint on U, or a, so a ramp constraint on the battery. What this means is um, the battery also has a power capacity. So you can't put you know, an infinite amount of energy into the battery. You can't fill it up instantaneously, essentially. There's, there's a limit to how much power it can suck out or, or push out at any given time. Um, and also, very importantly, this last constraint is that you can't put in more energy than you actually have. <laughs> Right, so, you, so, so U always has to be less than or equal to ET. You can never sort of t put it more energy into the battery than you're actually generating with the wind. I guess if you wanted to, you could also have a system where you could do that by just paying for electricity on the market, but we're going to assume you can't do that right now. All right, and so what happens here? So here is the energy stored in the battery. Uh, this is a big battery, it's in megawatt hours, which is a very, very big battery. Um, but it's all sort of make-believe units anyway here, so don't take it, don't read too much into the physical actually units here. Um, here is a graph though of the storage over time for how much energy is in the battery right now. Um, and so of course the, the slope of this line would just be how much we're taking out or putting in at any given time. So, so the derivative here would just be essentially the, the derivative of the first difference would be u, so I'm not, I'm not even bothering to plot that. So this is a pretty complex um, plot here. And I think actually I, I don't have the, the corresponding plot of, uh, of, of the, the price and that. But essentially what's happening here is that this plot, so here's the cost. I should probably put these on the same page. But here's the cost. And here is the control that we have, or the battery schedule that we have. And what we're effectively doing is we're taking advantage of the fact that that cost is varying over time, and the, also the power we're generating is varying over time. And we're 
using that intelligently to effectively when, so this period where it's putting a lot of energy into the battery, you can't quite see it, but I'm, I'm certain that the, um, the cost of electricity in that time will be relatively low. Whereas these little times where all of a sudden your energy drops a lot, that means you're putting second energy out of the battery. And so that means and those are probably places where the price of energy is relatively high. Right, so we're, we're sort of doing, you know, when this is happening, it means there's, there's been a sort of a, an increase in the total amount of, or we bought at a lower price for the battery and now we're flushing it all out to make more money. Um, and the corresponding thing happens uh, when, 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 it, when you're putting energy into the battery, it's, 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 uh, the price of energy is relatively low as compared to what it's going to be when you, when you flush it out. Um, so this is, again, a fairly complex uh, control policy here. I would never have thought, you know, it would be very hard for me to write a program um, that would do exactly this. Mainly because this, what this depends on largely is sort of the exact balance of what future costs are going to look like uh, versus the present costs and you know, how long, when, when those right trade-offs are going to be hit exactly right. Um, so you, you can imagine this is actually a pretty, it makes a lot of sense in, in retrospect, but it would be pretty hard for me to write a program that would, that would do exactly this without, without a lot of different cases, a lot of if statements, stuff like that. So again, the beauty of optimization here is that we just tell it what we want to do, namely minimize or maximize our profits, and it kind of handles the rest. The optimization figures out, given exactly all, what's gonna, everything that's going to happen in the system, given all the, the, the future costs and everything, uh, what should we do to, to, to optimize that? And I guess in this case, we make about 17% more, more profit when you add the storage versus if you didn't have storage at all. But this is a lot of storage too, so this is sort of a simple case. Um, but just again, illustrating the, the possibilities of, uh, of these things. And I guess the, the real advantage here, as I say, is what would be, theoretically, if you have very high penetration of wind resources, then what storage actually lets you do is, is, is um, avoid the need for things like spinning reserve. Big generators are always spinning, but, but never being, not being used. So this, these, these two examples, I think, give a fairly broad, but also somewhat intuitive introduction to control optimization. So this is why we treat control optimization, because it's oftentimes much easier to specify what you want to optimize, namely cost or something like this, than specify a program that will actually achieve that. It's much better to specify what you want to achieve and let the optimizer take care of how you go about doing that. Yeah? Uh, could you explain the control uh, constraint that we run? Oh, uh, this one here? Yeah. So all this is saying is that there's essentially a power capacity to the battery. So batteries can't put in, can't, you know, put in all the, if, 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 if your um, turbines are generating a megawatt or a couple megawatts um, and you have a battery, that also the capacity of say a megawatt hour, which is a very, which is a pretty big bat battery, um, then you cannot just instantaneously, if your turbines are generating, you know, in a minute, 60 uh, kilowatt hours, you cannot charge your battery fully, so 60 megawatt hours, 60 megawatts, you cannot charge your battery in a minute. There is going to be a, a, a maximum power that your battery, at which your battery can sort of suck off or put out energy. And, and, and any battery will have these. I mean, you can't, just like when, you know, you can't charge your phone instantaneously by drawing more current, um, it has to do it slowly. And similarly, you couldn't use it all instantaneously. That would fry the internals. Yeah? Um, was the initial storage constraint to be zero in this case? Uh, yes, it was, yeah. So initially, we, we, we had zero storage. That was just a constraint. I, I guess I just didn't write that. But yes, that would be a constraint and definition problem, too. Okay, now these, these highlighted two examples here. And they were sort of examples for simple dynamical systems, uh, but a couple natural questions arise. First of all, these were simple systems. They were both linear systems, one state variable, one control. Um, and it was sort of obvious how using your control you could affect the state, right? I mean, you put in energy to store more energy, you take out energy to store less, or you turn on the heater to heat the room, less to cool it. Um, there are also cases where the relationship between control and states are not anywhere nearly as, as, um, as well defined or as, as obvious, I guess. I shouldn't say they're very well defined. They're just not as obvious. So for example, there can be cases where you have several state variables, say you know, 
10 state variables, variables, but only two controls. Yet those two controls affect all the state variables in different ways. So is it possible by sort of cleverly changing how you do control to actually affect all those state variables in the way that you want to? Even though you only have two controls and uh, 10 state variables. And we'll come up with a concrete example of this, of, of this in a second. A second point, which is very important here, is that we assumed everything was known about the dynamics. We assumed the dynamics were deterministic, and we assumed that the future, the things like the price of energy and the power of wind, that was all known to the, to the controller beforehand. We, we you know, solved it once at the beginning of time using all these, XT, these CTs and ETs in the future. And that's a very big assumption here. In reality, for anything like this, those would have to be predictions, right? We have to just predict what's going to happen in the future using machine learning or any other technique that you want to use. Um, and then sort of do our, make our best guess based on that prediction. Or, or, or somehow solve this problem you know, well based on some sort of uncertainty we have in what this could be in the future. Now in, in practice this becomes a really hard, to solve this exactly is very, very hard it turns out. So when there's uncertainty in your future, when there's noise in your system, of a general form, it can be very hard to solve things exactly, but there do exist very good approximations or heuristics that perform very well in practice. Um, and in particular, one thing that we're going to look at a lot is a method called model predictive control, or MPC. And MPC essentially does, intuitively, what it does is it just says, we're going to, you know, we have an uncertain system and we have uncertainty in our predictions. We're just going to make the best prediction we can right now and solve a system as if that was the true future. Okay, then we're going to take the first action it prescribes. So we're going to take like that first storage or the first whatever it prescribes. Um, at that point, we'll be later on, we might have better predictions or understandings of what happened. Maybe what we thought would happen didn't happen. And we'll just make new guesses then and solve everything again. So don't worry about that. We're, I'll, I'll find that in much more detail now. But essentially, the, the, the big point here is that in these cases, uh, we often cannot solve things optimal anymore. We're not going to get an optimal solution. So this is approximate optimal control in some sense. Uh, but methods like model predictive control can work very well in practice. And that's, we'll actually spend some time talking about that particular technique uh, and seeing how well it, if, when, and, and how well it works. So, Let's see, let, that is the end, I believe, of this set of slides. So let me very quickly um, introduce the next, boy, I keep hiding my cursor there. Let me introduce the next thing we're going to talk about here. Um, but just do it kind of quickly because I, I do want to leave about 10 minutes for talking about the, the homework. All right, so, so that last unit was kind of introduction to all of control. Okay, right? So dynamic systems, control optimization, all these things. What I'm going to do now is sort of take and then you know, a, a, a preview of optimal control and stochastic optimal control, stuff like that. Model predictive control, stuff like that. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take each of those things and discuss in a little bit more detail. So we're going to first talk about um, dynamic systems in a little bit more detail, describe what those are. Uh, I gave you the definition of you know, x t plus 1 equals f of x t u t. But let's look at some more particular forms of this, uh, different, di different types of systems, and let's, we're going to look at certain properties of these systems. So if we, if we have a linear system, what can we say about that system? How can we analyze it? What are some interesting properties? Can we say things like, this, you know, uh, given this many controls, I can or cannot reach this state of the system? These are all very important problems, but, and, and actually for linear systems, we can answer them very concretely. Uh, so, in particular, there are several different types, several different extensions or different cases of dynamical systems, which again is just from a fundamental standpoint, we'll talk about just the discrete, mostly discrete time here. So you should know continuous time because we oftentimes use it to come up with our first system. You know, we'll use a lot of physics to write down the equations for a dynamical system, but we'll, we'll typically just focus on discrete time in this case. Um, there are lots of different special, there's lots of different specialties of these things. So there's, there's first of all, there's linear systems, systems which, which we've talked about, but we'll cover in a lot more detail here. There are partially observable systems. 
And this is where you don't, I think I mentioned this briefly before, but, but you don't observe the full state. So you need some way of figuring out what it might be so that you can use a controller that depends on the state, right? If you don't observe the whole state, how can you use a controller that depends on the state as an input? Um, I'll talk a little bit about, go back to continuous time, continuous time briefly here, um, to talk about differential algebraic equations. These, we are not going to see them too much uh, in, this, in this course here, but essentially um, these occur when you have differential equations plus additional nonlinear equality constraints on your system. And these arise, and the reason why I'm talking about that, though we're not going to focus too much on it, is these arise in the dynamical representation of, of um, power flow. So if you represent generators as actual spinning machines now, not just as things that can control their power, but look at actually how they generate their power, well they have a big rotor that's spinning, that has some inertia to it. Um, if you write down equations for that, plus the fact that there are power flow constraints in all these systems when they're interconnected, you get a set of equations that have some differential equations and some equal nonlinear equality constraints which correspond to power flow. And that's going to, that's, that's why we're going to talk a little bit about um, differential algebraic equa equations. I'll briefly talk about stochastic systems or, and, 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 and the MDPs. We will deal with some stochastic systems uh, going forward, especially when we have things like approximate optimal control. Uh, we'll use MDPs a little bit less, but they are an important special case of stochastic systems that we can solve for, again, very sort of small state, discrete, uh, so finite number of the states and actions you can take. We, we can solve them, so they're, they're good to know about. Um, and then there are many, many others, uh, which we're not going to talk about. There are huge numbers of other specializations of these things. But this actually also does a pretty good job of covering a lot of the, a lot of the things that you, you may see. You can, of course, combine them. Like you can have stochastic uh, differential algebraic equations. Like it's really nasty. Uh, but you can have things like that. All right, so let's go back to talking now about linear systems. Um, so remember, linear systems were systems of the form. And I'm actually going to uh, omit the affine term here for the most, for the most part. Uh, and just think about the, the discrete time linear system as a system that says xt equals a xt plus b ut. Remember, x, oops, xt plus 1. Um, remember, x is a vector in Rn, n is the number of states, and ut is a vector in Rm. So we had a simple case before where these were just both one dimensional, um, but of course, what really is interesting is when the case when they're, they're higher dimensional. And you have a lot of things to control, a lot of things to, a lot of different controls that can do it. As I mentioned before, this also has the form of the continuous time analog would be saying that x dot equals ax plus bu. That says that the instantaneous derivative uh, of, of x equals some matrix a times x plus b times u. And again, you can convert between these two approximately through Euler integration. Actually, I forgot to have this in the next slide. No, I don't. So you can put through this approximately with Euler integration. Um, the way you would do that is we'd say that, well, for this case, xt plus 1 equals xt plus 1. Um, xt plus 1 plus delta t x dot. So this would equal uh, xt plus 1 plus, sorry, xt. xt plus delta t x dot. Um, x t plus 1 plus a x t plus b u t. Um, and so this then would just equal i plus a x t plus delta t. Um, I should write delta t there. Delta t b, and a delta t there. Delta t b u t. So if this thing here is your sort of new A, and this thing here is your new B. This is now a discrete time system um, that you get from your continuous time system. And what's really nice about linear systems is that, and this, this almost exactly relates to um, the case type of before where because linear, linear constraints are convex, you can solve these in a convex framework. And it turns out there actually are even more efficient ways of solving a lot of these problems 
than just writing optimization problem. For a lot of linear systems, there exist very specialized routines that will solve certain optimization problems, but do it very quickly. Um, the same way we had for least squares, it was such a common problem that we're, we could just solve it really quickly with this, this um, analytical form. We can do the same thing for linear systems, it turns out. So let's take, let's, let's look at one example, which is also a room heating example, but it's a little bit more complex. So now what we're going to say is that instead of just one room, there are four different rooms. Um, and we now have a differential equation for each of these four rooms. Uh, and importantly, what's interesting about a configuration like this is that the change in temperature in room one, well, room one borders on the outdoors, right? It has two walls that are facing outdoors, so the outside temperature will affect it. But it also borders on room two and room three. So those rooms will also affect the temperature change, right? Because there's also going to be heat dissipation through the walls. And so, again, we'll assume this is a bad insulation between walls, I guess, here to, to make things easy. Um, but, but we're going to see the other rooms also affect the temperature of the current room. Okay? And using the same sort of heat flow we saw before, it's actually possible to write the derivative so this, this is sort of the, the continuous time formulation for, for this, um, as a function of the other rooms and then some constant times your heater in your own room. So we have two walls. I'm going to let k sort of capture all those constants, at least in the continuous time case. So k is sort of, sort of all those specific heat and area and, and, and connectivity, all that kind of stuff. Um, so the change at the instantaneous derivative of temperature in the room one um, will equal sort of the area of how much borders the other places times their temperature there, right? So it has two walls that face the outside. So it'll have 2K times T external minus T1 will be how the external temperature affects it. Then it has one wall bordering T2. So K times T2 minus T1 plus, again, one wall boring T3. So K times T3 minus T1. Um, I think I might be getting cut off there, but plus B plus D U1. So U1 is the injection of, of, of uh, energy into the room. All right, so does this sort of equation here make sense to everyone? Why we're running it like that? And of course, now also, uh, T2 and T3 have their own dynamical systems, look just like this, just with the correct sort of rooms that they border mirroring this. So what's nice here is that this actually seems pretty complex, right? Because you know, the temperature in T in room 1 is affected by rooms 2 and 3, and the temperature in 2 and 4 is affected by those two also. So you have all these sort of very interconnected different systems here. Um, but linear systems and that formulation gives us a very compact way to express this. So we're going to write now the equations for all these things in terms of a matrix form. We're going to write this. We're going to let the t's be our x's. And we're going to write this as x dot equals ax plus bu. Simultaneously for all the rooms, importantly. We're going to write one equation that does all of that. Um, and let me just sort of write this, and then we'll, then we'll move on to the homework. So um, doing a few things, so, you know, assuming that we, uh, we, we have, um, we do things like uh, also convert to discrete time, everything like that. Um, if we write this, then what we see is that, OK, this term, t1, so, so our, our x here is going to be sort of a vector of all the different t's. So x t plus 1 will equal x t. And then we're going to do, do our other integration here, which is delta t times some matrix um, times x t, sorry, x t plus 1 times x t. Um, and here x is going to be just the vector of you know, t1, t2, t3, t4. So if you look at this equation, th this is just going to be that derivative term, right? Because we're sort of doing the Euler integration here, uh, building it in. Uh, what we see is that if we look at the terms that involve t1, this derivative, there's going to be four of them, right? We have or the, the coefficient on t1 here in total is actually going to be 4 times k, negative 4 times k, right? 
because we have negative 2k here, negative k here, and negative k here. So the first, the sort of this term here, which determines how uh, the first element here affects the, the, the um, derivative of that first element, there'll be a negative 4k. Um, and similarly, if we look at you know, how t2 affects the time derivative of t1, there's going to be a k here, a k here, and a 0 here. Does everyone understand where I'm coming up with, this, with, with, with these terms in this matrix? Right? So I won't write it all, but if you fill it out, um, what you see is that you get this being your A matrix. And actually, you know, I plus delta t times that would be your discrete time A matrix. Um, you get this, a similar thing for your B matrix. You get delta t times these D terms. Um, and I'm assuming right now that there are actually only heaters in rooms 1 and 2. So we don't have heaters in rooms 2. So our state, our, our control here is actually in R2, not in R4. And the control just affects the temperature in rooms two and rooms, uh, sorry, in rooms one and rooms two directly. Of course, it'll affect other rooms indirectly too, right? Because the heat flow will, will affect those other rooms. So the question is, you know, how do we actually, what do we do with that? Um, and then you have, of course, your dependence on external temperature too. So I'll, I'll uh, oh wait, no, I have, I'm thinking 1040 for some reason. I was, I was going to stop early. So let me <laughs> keep going. Um, I guess I just had a wrap it around 1040 and then I was thinking. Anyway, um, okay, so, so maybe actually I can, I can get to this, this point now. So, um, sorry, I'm more in a little more detail now, so I'll just fill out this whole thing. Uh, so you have k here, negative 4k. Um, what is that? It'll be 0. k, k, 0, and negative 4k, k, and then 0, k, k, negative 4k. Okay, um, that's how our. Previous state affects our current state, so of course, um, you know, i plus this thing is equal to to the a in the discrete time case. Our b is just going to be um, delta t times. So here, u is going to be uh, u one and u two. We only have heaters in rooms one and two. So that will directly affect the temperature difference in room 1 with the coefficient d, d, and the rest will be zeros times ut. Um, and then you have some, I'll just write it at, where this is at. They all have two, two rooms that border on the outside, so this is our dynamical system. Okay, now here's the $100 question. I'm not going to actually pay that much, so I'll just might as well make it a million dollars, right? Here's, here's the big question. Um, Given this setup and just two heaters, rooms one and two, can you control the temperature in all the rooms in any way you want? And what I mean by that is, if I give you some amount of time, say 10 time steps, can you get the heat in all those rooms to any temperature that you want? And I'll even let you give, give you the fact that these are actually, these are, these are sort of amazingly powerful heaters. They're arbitrarily powerful. Um, and they can cool too, so they're really heaters or coolers. They just can inject or take out energy of a room. Um, so the question is, can you do it? Can you control the, the, uh, the rooms to any temperature you want? With just two. If you had four, it would be obvious you could, right? You just sort of, that would be very intuitive. With just who thinks it's possible with heaters in those two rooms? Who thinks it's not possible? You have to pick one of those two. <laughs> Who thinks it's possible? Show of hands. Okay. Who thinks it's not possible? Okay. Um, other big question is, does it matter what two rooms they're in? What, what should you, okay, so that's actually a different question. What, what if you have only one heater? Can you do it then? Show of hands. Who thinks you can do it with one heater? Okay. Who thinks you can't do it with one heater? Okay. Um, who thinks it matters what two rooms they're in if you have two heaters? Or can they be in any two rooms? So who thinks it matters what rooms they're in? I think it's those like clickers that, that everyone uses, right? So people don't feel as bad raising their hand. Who thinks it, so who thinks, who thinks it does, does not matter? Who thinks it matters what rooms they're in? So we'll actually, this is actually going to be on the, on the next homework, so you'll figure this all out. 
But I'll tell you how to do it. Okay, so here, here's the, here's the um, this is a question related to something called controllability. All right, of dynamical systems. And here's the basic idea. So if we have a system with this equation, xt plus 1 equals axt plus b ut. I actually will not add the extra term. It ends up not affecting it at all because if you can control it with no constant term, you can always just add some more stuff and control the constant term. Um, that's not obvious, by the way, but it actually ends up being true under some assumptions. Um, okay, so you have a system like this. Now, I'm going to say that my state at x0 will be my state at time 0. Okay? And that's, that, that's the thing that's given to you. That's fixed, that that's known. And I want to know, can I, um, can I get my system to some other x, say x star, over t time steps? Where t actually can be as big as you want. Unless you take as much time as you want to do it. Which is actually, this seems like a hard problem, right, by the way, because you know, I'm saying, given as much time as you want, maybe you can do anything with as much time as you want. Maybe. Um, okay, so, so let's start now by writing what the state at time 1 is going to be. So the state at time 1 is going to be x1 equals a times x0 plus b times u. Well, maybe I'll write this as, as, as x1, this 2, just to keep things consistent. So x1 is known, and we, have, we want to start in x1, and we want to get to x star. So x2 equals a times x1 plus b times u1. And we can choose what u1 is, right? All right. Um, now, let's look at what x3 is. Well, x3 equals a times x2 plus b times u2. But we have another equation for x2 already. is isn't really, we can't really decide that. That's actually just given to us by our u1 there. So this is also equal to a times a times x1 plus b times u1 plus b times u2, which equals a squared x1 plus a b u1 plus b u2. Okay, so I'm just writing these whole things out. And you can probably imagine that if I kept doing this, I would have an equation for xk, and you can do this a few more times to make sure that, that I'm not lying to you here. This looks something like this. This is uh, a to the k, actually a to the k minus 1, if you want to be specific. Um, I think I might be starting from x0 here, so don't worry too much about that. Um, a to the k minus 1 times x1 plus a to the k minus 2 times b times u1 plus a to the you know, k minus 3 uh, times b u2 plus the dot um, b u, sorry, yes, b u k minus 1. Okay, so that's just basically repeating this whole thing again and again. Keep on substituting for what I know, um, from what I determined from previous states, and then writing it in terms of these things. Okay? Now I'm going to write this whole thing. So, so this one we have no control over, right? So this guy here we, is given to us um, because x1 is fixed at the beginning. So we have no control over this guy. Everything else, there is a u term there. So we could theoretically affect that. So I'm going to write this thing as a matrix form, saying it's equal to a to the k, and I guess I wrote k plus 1 there, so that's, okay, that's, that's, that's what I did. Um, so it's equal to a to the k times x1 plus this whole thing um, times my vector of all my u's here. Okay? So now what's really cool is that now this is actually a linear system. The question of can I reach some new state is a question of does this equation have a solution? Right? So what it's saying is, um, so yeah, I, I'm going to erase this. Hopefully it's, it's on there. So hopefully that's, that's okay. Uh, I actually want to write that equation because it sort of bears, bears some importance here. Um, so xk plus 1. Uh, we want that to equal, uh, you know, set equal to x star, which is equal to a x k plus this thing, uh, a x sorry a k uh, 
uh, a to k k, ah, a k x one, <laughs> a k minus one b, a k minus two b dot to b times the vector of all the u's u one u two u k. Okay. This is now a, a set of linear equations. Right? We want to just find some u such that just call this uh, you know call this a big you should call it like a big C matrix, but I won't really. Uh, like a script, script DC or something like that, people use. It's called the controllability matrix. Um, the, the requirement for this to ex have a solution is that this thing has to be full rank. It ha for, first of all, it has to have, um, so, so remember x here, xt is an R. N. Uh, this guy is going to be, actually, what's the dimension of this guy? Is this one? Care to say? This thing here, what's the, what's, what's, what's the size of this vector? How tall is it, first of all? First terms are just A here, so how tall is it? Yeah, so this is going to be n is the size of it, and how wide is it? That's actually another really good question. K, but then how big is each of these b's? So it has k of these terms. And how big is each one? How big is how, how many how many uh, columns are in b? Very uh, ut is in r to the m. How many columns are in B? Right, M. So, how many things does this whole thing have? Yeah. MK. So, first of all, um, you need at least enough steps. K has to be at least big enough such that um, M times K is bigger than N. Otherwise, this is going to be a skinny matrix and will not have a solution. But if it's big enough, then the question is. Is it full rank? Right? Because there, there are n columns, so if it's full rank, that means there's the rank is going to be equal to n. And that means there are n independent columns of this matrix here. Um, I forget, is this the last slide I have on that? Yes. Uh, so, so I'll tell you another thing that's actually very surprising. Um, you may think that if you keep adding more and more k's here, you'll get you know, a bigger and bigger chance of this having n independent columns, right? Uh, it turns out that's actually not true. Uh, due to some sort of matrix algebra, linear algebra properties, you actually only need to go up to k being equal to n. After that, you don't get any more power from it. So, the way to check this if you can do that, is to just form this matrix a to the n minus 1, b, uh, a to the n minus 2, b, b. Form this guy. And then in MATLAB, just run rank of c. Okay? And if that is equal to n, that means you can get from any state to any other state. If it's not, it means you can't. So if this equals n, the system is called controllable. Otherwise, it's called uncontrollable. OK, let me stop there. Uh, I might rehash this a little bit next time, just very briefly. But this is sort of a, a really amazing property in some sense, right? So I, I can just look at matrices and tell you if I can get from any state to any other state. Okay, uh, let me stop there and then I'll hand out the homework.